I, I love the name of your podcast. Oh, thank you. Audacious Living. And I thought about that. When I first read your podcast name, I thought audacious. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that mean? That could have like 10 or 15 different meanings. Yeah. But I'd like to share with you and your, and your viewers the first thing that came to my mind when I thought about what does audacious yes. look like for me? Please do. It's this. It's boldness with God's wisdom attached to it. So I can be bold and stupid. I can be, I can have zeal ahead of knowledge and wisdom, but I've got to take God's word and all the wisdom contained therein and apply it to my zeal. Yes. Then I'll be successful. And for me, that's what audacious means. Greetings and salutations. This is the Audacious Living Podcast, and we strive to inspire and empower our listeners to live their best audacious lives ever. I'm thrilled to have you with us on our, our journey, and I appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here on this particular episode. Uh, we'll be talking about exploring resilience and faith, uh, and you know, it's very much like navigating through a, a dark room with the lights off. You know, just as turning on a light reveals hidden obstacles and furniture, embracing resilience and faith illuminates the path through the life's challenges and what that does it guides us towards growth and strength now dr guy glad is a seasoned author and educator with a background in counseling administration and strategic leadership uh, he's got a deep commitment to guiding individuals towards resilience and faith Dr. Glad's work focuses on integrating Christian principles into personal growth and overcoming obstacles. And this episode, we are honored to have Dr. Glad share his profound insights on resilience, faith, and the transformative power of embracing one's faith journey. Enjoy. Hey, Dr. Guy, thank you for joining me here today on the Audacious Living Podcast. I appreciate you taking the time to do this, so thank you. Oddly, it's it's an honor to me, and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Well, I, I just, uh, you know, I we, we spend so much time on this podcast and, and encouraging individuals to, to live that best audacious life that we, we talk about often here, and uh, to be able to engage in conversations of, of that, that can provide upliftment and encouragement, direction, even ideas of, of how to get there um, uh, is a wonderful opportunity and blessing as far as I'm concerned. So thank you for that, uh, for, for being a part of that journey with me. Um, the, the, the one thing that's very, very, very clear, and I, I don't think anyone will be surprised to hear this, that when you know that journey of life is as much as we want it to be uh, as rewarding and fulfilling as possible, sometimes on that pathway to get there, there will have obstacles and challenges and pitfalls, and some people call them tests. But regardless, they are things that we need to face and, and, and encounter. And oftentimes, those are the things that are in front of that greatness that we're after. Um, and so uh, looking very much sort of, sort of talk, looking forward to talking just about the, 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 the things that, you know, the resiliency, for example, that we need, uh, um, to, to, the, to get past adversity and, and things of that nature. But before we do that, I wonder if a starting point, if you can just fill our audience in, in terms of, uh, the work that you do, I know you're, you're doing a lot of writing right now. So maybe talk about the, your, your path to, to, the, to the point that you're at right now. Okay, well, I'll try to keep it short. Um, I am writing full time. Okay. I'm in the process of finishing up my fourth book. Mm -hmm. uh, my first three books are going into their second printing. Wonderful. I'm thankful for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I teach also at a, at graduate level, graduate school level. Most of my students are doctoral students, okay. and um, and that's pretty much what I'm doing right now. I've retired two times in my life so far. I spent 30 years in the army as an army chaplain, okay. ministering to soldiers and their family members. And then I went back to work for the army for seven years as a civilian uh, behavioral health and addiction medicine therapist, okay. where I had on average, an average week, I'd have 35 individual patients and I would run two groups also, one addiction group and one PTSD, combat PTSD group. Mm. Uh, and so um, I retired from that uh, after seven years because I really felt God calling me into teaching full time. And I, I phrase it like this. I, I frame it like this. It's time for me to start giving back. Yeah. And so I wanted to start writing, being an author 
has been a lifelong dream for me that, you know, one of those goals someday, mm. someday when, when it's the right time, I want to stand in the door and I'm ready to do it, Lord. And, and it came along seamlessly, just like everything else in my Christian life. Mm-hmm. Everything has been seamless. Everything has worked out for the best. And um, yeah, there's obstacles, there's speed bumps, there's tests and trials, but that's all promised in God's word. We will be tested. We will have trials. Right. Uh, but that's why God gives us his word and all of his principles in his word that if we follow them, we will be resilient. And there is no obstacle big enough for us to 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 be defeated by there is no right. speed bump big enough for us to get over and um and so that's been my primary life lesson i i love the name of your podcast well thank you audacious living and i thought about that when i first read your podcast name i thought audacious mm-hmm. what exactly does that mean that could have like 10 or 15 different meanings yeah but i'd like to share with you and your in your viewers the first thing that came to my mind when I thought about what does audacious yes. look like for me, Please do. it's this, it's boldness with God's wisdom attached to it. So I can be bold and stupid. I can be, I can have zeal ahead of knowledge and wisdom, but I've got to take God's word and all the wisdom contained therein and apply it to my zeal. Yes. Then I'll be successful. And for me, that's what audacious means. Yeah, no, I, I, and I, I love that definition. Thank you very much for sharing, Doctor, because I think um, you're right that there are various uh, understandings, definitions of, you know, of what it means to be audacious. For some, you know, the audacious guy is, you know, the, the loudest guy in the room, you know, he's audacious, but <laughs> it certainly is much more than that. And I think, um, uh, I think boldness is a wonderful word to sort of encapsulate that. Because really, what it does, it 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 shows you, it tells you, and actually, it's funny, I got bold. So I I, I do some speaking. I've got a, an acronym, so it's actually it's a bold acronym. So um, you know, and and, and so essentially, uh, this is this this bold this bold philosophy will allow you to live this best audacious life. And so the B stands for better than you were yesterday, which is which is really encompassing ongoing learning, right? Le- learning is continuous, is ongoing. Um, the O is outlast adversity. We know there'll be challenges. We know there'll be struggles. We know they're coming. As you said, right? It was promised. Uh, so we, you know, it it, it it it's something that we um, are going to see. The L in that framework is 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 live your truth. It's really about authentic authenticity. Um, you've got to be real to who you are. Um, you know, I can I, I, I can take that step, but if it's not in the, in in the direction meant for me, I'm not living my true self. And then the the the, the letter D uh, stands for disrupt the norm, right? You you've mm-hmm. got to be a trailblazer. You've got to go off that beaten path. Um, if everyone is going this way, um, you know you're not. Are, are you really being audacious? Are you really going in that direction? Because you're going in the same direction as everyone else. And um, uh, so I think bold. Th- thank you for using the bold, bold is a fantastic word because I think it, it encompasses it nicely. Um, and I also like to encourage and I talk I talk about the word courage because I think that's an, that's an important part of all this too. That you've got to be you have to have that courage to take that bold step to live audaciously. So, yeah, exactly. And and if I could just add on a little bit to that, sure. Broadly, um, boldness uh, can't just stand on its own. It has to be. Boldness within the framework of God's word. Mm -hmm. Boldness outside of God's will. Boldness outside of God's will uh, and word is nothing more than foolishness. Mm. So if I understand my left and right boundaries, my limitations in my life placed upon me like a compass. Yes. God's word is like a compass. It guides me. And in that left and right lane, if, as long as I stay in that lane, I can be as bold as the day is long. Mm. I can be passionate. I can I can be motivated. I can be excited. But boldness without wisdom and boldness without God's word just becomes arrogant foolishness. And I think that's an important distinction to make. I'm, I'm glad you did that. Made that distinction. Thank you. Um, your 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 faith obviously is a big part of your work. How has that influenced um, the I guess the direction of your life? Well, uh, the answer to that question starts way back in my senior year in high school. 
uh, where I, a after arguing with God for three months, I was involved, I was involved with a youth ministry in high school called mm -hmm. Youth for Christ Campus Life. Okay. And uh, every time I'd go to a meeting, like a fun event, like a roller skating party or a bowling party or something mm -hmm. like that, the leader would always sit us down halfway through and have a short five minute Bible study. And oddly, I could be having a great time. But after that Bible study, I was always depressed, mm. always sad, always like um, just just really sad for some reason. I finally said to him after a couple of months, I said, why does this happen? And he said, this is a quote. He said, because God's trying to convince you of your sin and your need to accept Christ as your savior. Now, I argued, I thought it was a pretty good guy. You know, I wasn't guilty of any major right. sins or anything like right. that. So I spent three months every night at home in my bedroom arguing with God <laughs> about why I wasn't a sinner and I didn't need Christ. Uh, but guess what? After three months, guess who won that argument? God. Yep. And, and so I start, that's my starting point for my story because Oddly, it turned my life around 180 degrees. Mm. I could not see myself doing anything for the rest of my life, but preaching, teaching, or counseling God's word in a ministry somehow, somewhere, right. uh, being led by God. And I mean, as a kid, I was, growing up as a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted sure. to be a paleontologist. I wanted to be a law enforcement officer. I even went so far as to take the written exam and get accepted. Gotcha. But when I came to Christ, like the Apostle Paul said, I count all things as a loss for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ, my Savior. And so for the rest of my life, um, you know, I was in the youth ministry for seven years. Mm -hmm. I was a civilian pastor for six years, an army chaplain for 30 years. Uh, a, a civilian behavioral health and addiction medicine, PTSD and, and um, uh, therapist, combat PTSD therapist. Uh, and now I'm writing full time and uh, in all my books, either attempt to focus the reader onto the resilience and the resources and God's word, his mm -hmm. character and his promises, yeah. or to, or to, um, challenge an unbeliever or someone who has left the faith to come back to Christ and see that he is the only way. Uh, so, so, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I very much appreciate that. Um, it, it's, it's, it's obviously clear that it, there's been an influence and in, in how you've not only uh, um, uh, the, the work you've chosen to get involved with, but the manner in which you live your life and uh, being that uh, being that sort of example or beacon is so important for others to be able to see. Right? So you're not just talking it, you're walking the talk as well. Yep. Um, and that's a that's, that's a key aspect of, of, of having an impact on people, um, particularly those who are going through challenges and struggles. And you did mention um, that you work with those with uh, with addiction issues and recovering from PTSD. I would imagine um, uh, that would have been a very trying time or difficult time, given the nature of some and, and the seriousness of of, of, of of the challenges that you're dealing with. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Um Conducting therapy with someone who has addiction issues or combat PTSD issues is extremely challenging because of the emotions involved. Yes. There's underlying emotions. So most of the time, the primary reason somebody, for example, alcohol, the primary reason somebody binges on alcohol or abuses alcohol is because they haven't learned the skill of managing their negative emotions. And so alcohol has this promise this promise, I'll help you forget. I'll help you be resilient. I'll help you um, get get ahead of these prom these problems. And right. then the next day they wake up and the problems are worse because the problems are still there and now they have a hangover. Mm -hmm. Same thing with combat PTSD, really any PTSD. I mean, there's you can have natural disaster PTSD. Right. You can have sexual trauma PTSD. You can have um, uh, childhood um problems, childhood, domestic violence issues, uh, or you can have combat PTSD. PTSD comes from many different places, mm -hmm. but it always looks the same. And it's the same as 
treating addiction, and that is you got to get to the heart of the matter, which is not the traumatic event. Right. It's the emotions attached to that event. And nobody wants to deal with that. Mm -hmm. It's easier just to talk about the event. I mean, if you go to Denny's on a Saturday morning and you find a, a big round table full of combat veterans uh -huh. and you just sat down there and listened, they would tell story after story after story of their combat experiences. Yeah. Yeah. But none of them would talk about how they feel hmm. about those combat experiences. So I started in my PTSD group um, th the first time. I took the group to kind of get to know the 15 guys in the group. Mm -hmm. I said, I just want to ask you all, you know, we introduced ourselves. They told me their story. Of course, all of them told me their name. Yep. All of them shared that combat story that they yep. had, the traumatic event. And I said, I want to end today's session. And I want to give you something to think about for next week's session. And they went, okay, cool, Dr. Glad. And I said, here's the question. Think about that traumatic event that you just shared in your introduction with me mm -hmm. and next week i want you to share with the group and me what feelings you have attached wow. to that trauma and oddly you could have heard a pin drop because now now the the fear is in them they got to yeah, open up that yeah. can of worms and you know when you open up a can of worms it stinks oh, absolutely I, I i got sorry to cut you i gotta ask though did they identify it as trauma at that point or was it just a story to them? Well, uh, they understood what it meant when us medical personnel would, would call it trauma. Okay. Okay. They understood that that's just a medicalism, just another, another catchy term for what they went through. And uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to quote what some of them said in describing their experiences, but you can imagine it's colorful language. Sure. It's gravelly. It's gritty. It's down to earth. But with, they would call it something that's really reflective of their feelings, but they, they, they were fine calling it that, but they did not want to hmm. open up that can of worms. Wow. Wow. So how, how, how difficult was it to get that going <laughs> and, and open well, it up, getting it open up? Well, it surprisingly, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be. Okay. But the difficult part was keeping them on track hmm. because for so long, they allowed their automatic negative thoughts and those emotions to derail them. It, it's their automatic setting in life. They, yes. they viewed everything that happened to them through automatic negative thinking. Yes. Also known as ANTS. I have my own acronym, A-N-T, hmm. ANTS, ANTS. Yeah, yeah. yeah automatic negative thinking and they had to learn the skill of defaulting to positive thinking mm. you know like romans 8 28 god uses all things for good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes and so that's the positiveness in it is that god's always in control i don't care what the media says i don't care right. what's going on in washington i don't care what's going around right. around the world the chaos that we face every day that's a part of resilience that biblical faith will give a person is that is that in the middle of chaos, in the middle of anxiety, I can stay calm. Yes. So they continued as time would go on. If I didn't continue beating this drum, every group, then sooner or later, one of them would go off track and start to talk about the truck, the event again, and not the feelings. And so I had to gently, constantly bring them back on the track. And that was a repeated activity for me. Come on, guys, let's come back on track. What does that feel like? What emotions are you feeling? And, and they smiled just like you're smiling right now, oddly. They would smile and go, oh, Dr. Guy's at it again with his, well, how does that feel? <laughs> Well, you 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 you're undoubtedly challenged them in ways that they've never had to before, right? It's it's, it's exactly right. And, and and I would even bet that for some of them, some of them, they didn't even know how to properly express their feelings. Like it was a new new realm altogether for them. It was like having drowning men without any life jacket. Wow. They would go down and come back up again. Now, some of them had really wise wives. Yeah. But the wives never never um, approach it the way I did in therapy. The wives would just say to, to them, you really need to see someone, get some help. <laughs> That's how they would frame it. Right. Um, right. And so, so honestly, 
oddly for a lot of combat veterans, it's much easier to go to Denny's on a Saturday morning and laugh and joke and eat their pancakes and share their stories. But, but if you sat in on that Denny's breakfast group and you said the question, you said to him, you said, Bob, what did that feel like? That entire table would shut up because mm. nobody has ever approached it that way. Right, right, right. And that's, and that's, yeah, it's going into a whole new realm. And I could see where, yeah, it was like, what do I do now? Kind of a thing, right? Like I've never had, I've never had to talk about my full feelings, but there, there, there is a part of this. And, 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 uh, and I appreciate the fact that you've done that with them. Uh, there's a part of having that conversation that gives you some freedom. Right. If you're if you're if you're bottling up and you're holding on to it and, and 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 then what naturally happens is your actions start to align with these emotions that you're bottling up and you're not, and you're limiting yourself or you're self-sabotaging behaviors or who knows all sorts of things that you're doing, not recognizing it's because of the emotions that you're bottling up. And so I would imagine that once you start to do that, go through that process with them, you start to see some freeing up. Yeah, and, and I want to share with your viewers mm -hmm. um, from my first book, Ambushed, okay. The Siren Song of Alcohol Use, that about the research indicates on any given Sunday morning in church, there are about up to 20% of the congregation is struggling with secret addictions mm. of some kind, whether that be alcohol, other drugs, pornography, gambling, cheating on their spouse, whatever the case may be. And, and the kind of emotions that come with that, we all know this in our Christian lives, we've all failed sure. in our Christian lives. We've all sinned. And, and what are the two feelings that, that come to mind when we sin and we, we catch ourselves and we look back on that it's shame and guilt. Mm. And, and that's what Christians, Bible believing Christians need to understand that, that, the more they bottle up, the more we bottle up our shame and our guilt, yep. the worse it becomes and the more sinful our behavior becomes or our thinking becomes. Mm -hmm. And if I can just take my emotions to the cross, mm -hmm. lay them at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, this is why you died for me. And I embrace your forgiveness. I repent and I, I turn to God and embrace his grace and mercy Talk about being freed up. Yeah. That will free you up. Yeah. That's liberation on a whole other level. Amen. The the the, the other part about uh feelings and emotions and and certainly in the in the context of of the coaching world, uh uh f f emotions oftentimes is, is seen as information. So if you're getting in if 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 it's there are emotions, if there are high emotions around something. There, there, there's there's information there's behind that there's more behind that that's worth sort of exploring and understanding and that's why the question about why or how or, or what what did you think about that or how do you feel about that that's why that's so important because usually there's something behind that that's leading to why these emotions are emotions is the output the byproduct but there's more behind it absolutely there is and if you can so let me give you my example and one mm -hmm. of the reasons one of the many reasons I wrote my book ambushed is because I came from a Marine Corps home. I was an only child and my father was a Marine Corps drill instructor who was an alcohol abuser. Mm -hmm. And when he drank, he was verbally abusive. And I spent my entire life as a kid growing up two or three times a week protecting my mother from her husband, mm -hmm. who because of the alcohol abuse uh, just, just lost all control. Right. And so there were certain patterns regarding surrounding alcohol abuse I saw growing up and experienced growing up that carried over with me into my 30 years in the army as an active duty army chaplain. Right. Every one of my soldiers who came to me for counseling that were having uh, problems in their career or their marriage, they were abusing alcohol. Right. The same patterns were there. Then I went to work for a large army teaching hospital for seven years as an addiction medicine and PTSD therapist. And the same patterns were there. Alcohol is, is an equal opportunity destroyer. Yes. It doesn't matter your skin color, your gender, no. your, your country of origin, your socioeconomic background. It doesn't matter because 
research indicates all the consequences, all the negative consequences connected with alcohol abuse are predictable and expectable. I, I, I don't even have to know anybody. If I, if I have a new patient coming in to see me that someone has referred, and all I know is the reason they're coming to see me is alcohol abuse or alcoholism, I got 80% of the story right with that one sentence because I, I can guess fairly accurately what they're struggling with. Right. And two of the things they're struggling with is are, are denial and arrogance. So we we got to stop denying that that we're not imperfect sinful human beings. Right. Right. We've got to stop denying that we may have lost control of our lives because of the behavior we're engaging in. And so denial and arrogance, as a matter of fact, in one of my addiction medicine groups one time, um, it was an older group in terms of the time they were in treatment. Okay. And I was continually trying to come up with unique, catchy ways to, to make this whole thing different than the same old phrases with them. Yes. And I said, uh, we started the group and I said, hey, I want to share with, with you all. There was like maybe 18 in the group. I want to share it with you all something exciting that happened to me this week. And they go, what's that? And I said, I invented a new step in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay. And they looked at each other and go, Dr. Glad invented a new step in the 12 steps of AA. I said, yeah, you want to know what it is? And they went, yeah. I said, I call it pre-step one. And they go, mm -hmm. what's pre-step one? And I said, humble yourself. None of the other 12 steps work unless you humble yourself. Yeah. And there was this long pause, this long silence. And in a group, when there's a lot of silence, you know, you got them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that was an excellent group. When they came out of their shock, I asked the question, what are some ways that you have humbled yourself recently that you haven't in the past? Right. So it's a great question. Yes, I mean, that, 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 that's a great question to ask anyone. Forget the addiction. It doesn't ask anyone generally, right? <laughs> Amen to that. Right. I mean, if, if, if you really stop and think about it, like I'll, I'll even think myself, like, you know, um, I, 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 I can vividly recall. Okay. Yeah. Here. So here's, here, here's oddly Stevenson open up here. I can vividly recall a time when um, uh, I stopped thinking that uh that that you know that concept of a self-made man right like i can do it by myself and i you know i, I remember going no there's, there's no such thing like and i and when i look sort of back at my life i could see like a, a, a different points like when i had whether successes or wins or some sort of major accomplishment it wasn't oddly stevenson by himself there was something someone along the way that and it could have been as simple as a a, a vote of confidence um, you know, maybe I was given a resource or maybe some piece of information, but somewhere along the way, I got help to help me get to where I needed to be. And so when you can come to that under the recognize recognition that, yeah, you know what, it's, it's not all me. It's, it's, it's never been right. It's, it's, it is, it's very, it's, it's to your point, you are humbling yourself. And I think that's a very important exercise to go through because you're right. Nothing else follows afterwards. If you can't do that effectively. Amen. And, and there are really two sides to the coin called humility. Mm -hmm. The one side is humble yourself voluntarily, open your eyes and see the place of the transcendent God who is imminent in our lives. The creator of all things wants a personal relationship with me through faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. And he, he blesses me to be able to do what I have done and what I will do in the future. That's side one. Right. Turn over to side two. Side two is if you don't humble yourself, God will. And that's painful. Yes. Trust me, it's painful. I felt yeah. that pain. Yeah. And it's not, yeah. it's no fun. So side one is better than side two. Sure it is. Sure it is. Well, it's 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 that whole uh, idea of hitting rock bottom, right? And that's what you're talking about, like, yeah. like, and that's and that's oftentimes how far people have to get before they're like, yeah, you know what. I need to look at this. Uh, you know, you 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 hate you hate the idea of someone who struggles with alcoholism goes so far as to lose their whole family and lose their job or whatever else that comes with it before they realize 
I've got to change. But oftentimes that's exactly what the determining factor is. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, 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 I think, uh, and I, I think it works coincides well with humility is is as awareness. So you know, I I think uh, there's an analogy I use when I talk about awareness is you know you you imagine walking into a living room and you know in that living room you've got your sofa and your television and the couch and everything's laid out the coffee table is all there in the living room, and you turn off the light right, the light only covers it, the sur- the furniture is still there. And in order to see that furniture, you turn that light on and you can see it's, it's still, the things are still there. And so essentially the, 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 that light switch forms the awareness, but the pieces of furniture were always, always there. We just didn't see them. And that's how I kind of, uh, when, I, when I think about awareness, uh, that, that's how what I attribute it to because without awareness, um, again, the humility is not going to happen, right? Because you're not owning what's theirs and you're not taking ownership of that. And um, yeah, so I think awareness is a, a big part of, of of that of that healing process. Yeah, exactly. The and, and, uh, in in the scope of addictions, uh, I think that uh, can you sort of talk about how significant awareness is in that in that scope? Well, it goes back to that word denial. Ah, okay. Uh, if you want to, if somebody has an alcohol related incident, yes, like a DUI or their spouse kicks them out of the house because of their drinking problems, or the doctor says your kidneys are failing because of your alcohol abuse. Um, It it goes back to that idea of denial versus acceptance or uh, awareness of the truth. Mm -hmm. And so awareness of the truth is, again, if you look at either step one of the 12 steps of AA or step one of the eight steps of celebrate recovery, which is the Christian version of AA. They both talk about the same thing. And and that is, I, I came to the point in my life where I recognized I had given up control of my life to alcohol, right. or I lost control of my life to alcohol. That's a critical first step. Uh, and and as I mentioned earlier, there's even Dr. Glad's pre-step one. You got to humble yourself. Yes. So to be aware, if I can go back to your living room and light and darkness metaphor, mm-hmm. let me add a giant pink elephant to the middle of the room. <laughs> and you turn the light on <laughs> and you see this, all the furniture and a giant pink elephant. And you go, oh, I, I'm not going to recognize that exists. I'm going to turn the light back That's off because then I can't see it. <laughs> it's the same thing in the same so so if someone has an alcohol related incident diagnostically and medically that's a huge warning flag that this person is out of control mm-hmm. matter of fact with duis if a person has stopped for dui the the research indicates that they have driven under the influence more than 25 times previously and have not been caught mm. Wow. So that even makes the, the awareness and the flag even bigger. And so yes. I like to ask one question. Uh, sure. sure. Oddly, I, the question I ask to get beyond all, you know, the, the time of doing an assessment, I had to take my first patients through an assessment and the assessment lasts 30 minutes and has a bunch of questions regarding the alcohol use. I learned over time that there's one question you can ask. You could ask a family member, you could ask a friend, just in passing in the in a conversation. Here's the question. If you talk, if you start to drink, can you stop? Yeah. So, We're sitting here watching the football game and and you're you want to have a beer? Okay, I got no problem with that. I really don't. Because if you can stop, you know that you're probably going to have one can in the first quarter, uh, first half, and right. one can in the second half, along with the pizza and the pizza and the wings and everything sure, else. Sure, sure. But if you start to drink and you can't stop, that's a diagnostic medical indicator that mm. you you have some kind of a diagnosis, either alcohol use disorder, right. moderate or severe. Moderate is alcohol use disorder. Moderate is alcoholism onset. Alcohol use disorder severe is the actual condition of alcoholism and requires detox. 
But that one simple question, you could ask around, you know, when you're having pizza out at your favorite Italian restaurant mm -hmm. and you say, hey, I had this dude on podcast the other night. He asked a really interesting question. I wonder what y'all think about this. Right. If you start to drink, can you stop? Now, in your group of friends, they may all say, sure, no problem. Sure. That's a default answer for the addict also. I've got control. Sure, no problem. I'm all in control. Also, I will, I'm have, driving. <laughs> they also have a resume of work behind them, and that is DUIs, marital yes. problems that yes. are alcohol related, yes. career problems, et cetera. Yes, 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 yes. No, absolutely. And and I and I and I, I think it was really nice about that question. It it, it it forces you there. There are some that will answer or will force them to think about it and really and, and be honest with themselves. But you're right. The default for, for many is, of course, but the fact of the matter is they never tried. So they've never really been tested. So they don't really know. Right. They think they know. They think they're in control, but they don't really know. And that's the arrogance side of it. That's the second side of that coin. Either humble yourself or God will humble you. Mm, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's, let's talk about your writing. I mean, you said it's your full time writer now and and you're you're, you're using uh, just your years of experience, knowledge and insights uh, to, to, to help others and bless others by sharing. Um, uh, so you could talk about the work in, in that regard. Sure. Well, uh, an interesting process happened as I was writing. So as I mentioned earlier, my first book, Ambush, the Siren Song of Alcohol Use, was meant to specifically focus folks who are being challenged with alcohol use mm -hmm. issues. Uh, and then when I got done with that and it was published, I thought to myself, well, now, wait a minute. I talked about the inability to manage negative emotions as being one of the critical ingredients of alcohol use disorders. So why don't I write a second book on anxiety management, how to manage those negative emotions? So I did the second book, Personal Peace, Embrace the Promises, mm -hmm. focuses on all the promises of God written in his word that tell us that we can indeed manage anxiety. We don't have to be a puppet anymore on the string where anxiety is the puppet master. Right. I mean, you think think of all the commands in scripture. These God doesn't stutter. These are not suggestions. In the original Greek language, uh, for example, in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the original Greek language doesn't suggest something. It's written in the imperative mood, which is a command. And what's that command? Be anxious for nothing. Mm -hmm. But But God doesn't order us to do things that are impossible. Right. So you look at the rest of that verse and in the wealth of other verses on worry and anxiety throughout mm -hmm. the Old and New Testament. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul tells us, be anxious for nothing, but there's a key word there, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let mm -hmm. your requests be made known unto God, comma, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I have some friends back home, uh, w one in particular who is married to another friend of mine. Mm -hmm. She's having horrible anxiety problems in her life. And I shared some of this with her, uh, with them uh, at dinner one night. And, and I just wanted to encourage them. And I, I, I want to throw this out here to encourage your viewers too. And that is, if you know Christ as your Savior and you believe the Bible is the Word of God, one of those many principles in God's Word is that God gives us the command, we no longer have to be puppets to our anxiety. We can master our anxiety through the character of God, the promises of His Word, and our prayer life with Him. That's what the promise is. Right. That's what Jesus talked about in Matthew 6. That's what Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 26. We don't have to be puppets. And one of the things my friend's wife said to me was, I am so sick of being anxious all the time. I can't do anything. I can't be a good wife. I can't work. I can't function. I can't sleep. And I said, well, God has relief for you. 
And, and again, God doesn't stutter. He doesn't give suggestions. If he says something is possible, it is. Powerful. Very, very powerful. And, 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 and also truthful as well, too. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the idea of think so, so for many there, there, there's many that are carrying this idea of thought or notion that that they stand alone so again i talked earlier about me being a self-made man like they think they can they have they have control over every situation and 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 the deeper you get into it the deeper you realize the more you realize that you really don't have control over the situation and rather the situation is controlling you that's very well said oddly and in addition to that i would say that when people are struggling with issues or sin or problems that have beaten them multiple times right. or they're embarrassed to share with other Christians. We as human beings have a tendency to isolate ourselves, mm -hmm. to create an island, call it, call it Dr. Guy's Island, population one, or, or Audley's Island, population one. And, and we seem to live our lives thinking that uh, no one else has this problem. Right. No one else has struggles. Yep. No one else will understand when that's what everyone else is saying also at the same time. So right. what happens, for example, the Christian goes to church with their spouse on a Sunday morning. They see the pastor. This pastor smiles and shakes their hand and says, hey, good morning. How are you all doing? And they both smile and go, fine, pastor, we're blessed. And after church, they get back in their car. And they get back into their argument on the way home about one of their issues that are not being addressed. Right, right, right. No, nope. that's a great analogy, and it's very, very truthful. Very, very truthful. I gotta say, Doctor Guy, this is this has been fabulous conversation. I still so appreciate you uh, being here. I think the the the, the points that uh, you raised and enlightened us on uh, are important ones. Uh, for for listeners that wanted to to learn more about you or, or catch up with your work, uh, wh where could we send them? So uh, my books are available on either Amazon or. If you go to my website, my website is www.guyglad, that's one word, mm -hmm. all lowercase, guyglad.com, www.guyglad.com. I have on there a blog, I have on there musings, I have on there media of all my podcasts, and I have on there all my books and other publications that you can easily order with just one click, and and um, either way, you can you can find these things out, but I think... Uh, if I could just give one summary statement, sure. oddly, and sure. that is that if I could summarize, uh, oh, and so back to my third book, Resilient Faith oh. of Biblical Proportions, yeah. yes. it's a look into the lives of the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Mm -hmm. This is important for your viewers to hear, and that is every single person in Hebrews chapter 11, all Old Testament, mm -hmm. they were they were called out for their faith. They, they were shown as being models of resilient, successful faith. They all came from different circumstances. They all, all faced overwhelming circumstances. Some of them came from different countries, different ethnic backgrounds, but all of them had faith in God and obeying God. And what they, what, what the book Resilient Faith of Biblical Proportions does is it it gives a general overview principle of everything in life that faith covers. And it's an overarching umbrella. It covers everything. Right, right. If I make that determination. And so to summarize everything I've said, I would, I would encourage you and the listeners with this is there is always hope and you are not alone. Mm -hmm. So seek the help. Remember, the hope resides in Christ and not in some political figure, not in some law, not in a, a amount of dollars in your bank account, not in your promotion at work, mm -hmm. not in the success of your marriage. It rests in Christ and him alone. And, um, and I would encourage you to not isolate yourself, seek help, because, because God uses a lot of tools to get to us. Mm -hmm. And the tools are much more than just our pastor yes. yeah. or our own 
stick to itiveness, our yeah. own strength. Yeah. So I would encourage you with that. Very well said, and I, and and I, I think uh, it's an excellent note, note to close on because it really. Uh, remind us that you know we talk about the hope for as an example that you know hope hope ho the hope is always there you it's how it's how hard you want to cling on to and hold on to is really what counts and that'll make the difference for you so dr guy thank you this has been been awesome conversation really enjoy having you here um such a pleasure uh congratulations on a fantastic career 30 years in the military uh, another seven to go back and and and, and, and help more people uh, to be able to re retire again uh, for a second time is incredible but doing good work in the process and so thank you for this all the best and take care my friend blessings to you oddly thank you As Dr. Glad elaborated, humility and awareness are essential components in the journey towards healing and growth by acknowledging our vulnerabilities and seeking guidance from a higher power. You know, we can navigate life's challenges with grace and fortitude. Now, if you're inspired by Dr. Glad's words and want to learn more, don't hesitate to reach out directly. Uh, as, as always, the contact details are located in the show notes for this episode. Uh, Dr. Glad offers personalized coaching sessions and exclusive resources for those seeking to deepen their own faith journey and enhance their resilience. Uh, and certainly I'd encourage you to also uh, visit uh, his website for more information on these transformative offerings. Thank you for tuning in to the Audacious Living Podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to like, follow, and share. If you haven't already done so, uh, do so with your friends, family, and friends. It's that kind of support that helps us to continue to grow and inspire more individuals to live their most audacious lives. Join us next time for more empowering conversations and insights. Until next time, stay safe, be kind, show love to one another, and be audacious.